of the Norman Foster Foundation and Bloomberg Philanthropies, welcome. It's, um, it's a great pleasure to be in this special inspiring space, the space of ideas. And uh, uh, for all of us joining us also remotely and online, uh, also welcome. Um, I'm uh, the, uh, my name is Luis Bettencourt. I'm the Pritzker Director of the Mansueto Institute for Urban Innovation at the University of Chicago in the United States. And it's my pleasure uh, this uh, afternoon to uh, both introduce uh, the debate and moderate it. Um, I want to give you a little bit of sense of how it will work. So we'll have uh, essentially two panels followed by a little bit of a conversation and discussion time. And at the end of my remarks, I'll start introducing the various speakers. So uh, these debates are, I think, a wonderful tradition uh, now by the Norman Foster Foundation of sharing a lot of the really exciting ideas being developed about architecture and cities um, in essentially uh, a context of worldwide urbanization in the 21st century. Um, this week, uh, we have an extraordinary uh, group of people from all over the world, uh, each one innovators in their own way, but uh, bringing different perspectives from different disciplines, discussing um, particularly the issue and the challenge of informal settlements or slums. Now, many of you know that even uh, in a city like uh, Madrid, the problem of slums until recently was still a reality. Uh, but when you look globally and you see uh, the trends of uh, growing cities, particularly in the global south, uh, the numbers are just staggering. And so looking at this issue, uh, the issue essentially of development in cities, human development, uh, is really one of the great problems of our time. And uh, the design requisites that we're looking for globally in terms of global policy are really to address this issue and create great cities for, for all people within a generation. So think about that. In your lifetimes, it's a problem that we're committed to addressing and solving. Uh, the issue is that, of course, we don't know how to work on that scale. So we think uh, in this meeting, we're discussing it very actively, and we hope to give you a good sense of excitement about the ideas uh, that we're uh, creating and that networks of people all over the world are creating. We think that this time it must be different. It must be different because of the scale of the problem, because it is happening mostly in urban environments, in cities, which traditionally have been already places where uh, human development, economic growth, uh, and other solutions can sometimes be created. Uh, but it also must be different because we need to face the challenge of sustainability, of climate change, of, uh, of creating a planet that, um, that can uh, survive humanity, but indeed a planet where humanity is in greater harmony with, um, with, uh, with nature and its geophysical processes. And it's different also because of technology. Um, so we always talk a lot about technology in cities, but this week we're really asking for innovative ways, different ways probably, from traditional ideas, from even smart cities, uh, uh, ideas in which the human experience of living in cities and its potential, the promise of cities for human development, can really tell, uh, be inclusive, be global, and be fast. So that's sort of the ambition of the vision, and uh, we're very happy and very thrilled that you all can join us today. We feel that new knowledge needs to be created to achieve this, and I, it is the mission of the Norman Foster Foundation, a commitment from all of us participating, that this knowledge must be created in a, in a way that's networked, that's articulated, that's true of each place and its history, but it also must be novel, must catapult us forward in new ways. Uh, it's a time, I think, of great excitement in the sense that a great idea somewhere, and somewhere should be also Madrid and now, uh, could, have, uh, could create change and, uh, and development everywhere. Uh, and it is in that spirit that you'll see a lot of the presentations today. Uh, the first panel uh, will have a focus on uh, the experience and innovations that we are seeing, uh, particularly in uh, India and West Africa. These are, in some ways, the most exciting, but also more challenging parts of the world in which population growth will, um, will continue for longer, and where some of the largest cities in the world will be created by mid-century. It's also a space of tremendous innovation, particularly uh, coming from uh, community organization and ways of addressing age-old problems of architecture and planning as to how the architects and designers can work with communities to create better neighborhoods and better cities. Um, I'll say a few words uh, later about the second panel, but the second panel will have 
a focus on development, on uh, larger scales in some ways, dealing with economics and innovation, but also the human experience across generations of growing up and developing in a city such as Rio de Janeiro. So without further ado, I want to uh, um, introduce the first speaker, um, uh, Francis Carey. He's uh, an extraordinary uh, rising architect, I'm a huge fan of his um, uh, pavilion uh, at the Serpentine in 2017, one of my favorite buildings. And he will take us, um, he will start us off by giving you a sense uh, of how architecture at its most extreme and beautiful and formal also touches processes uh, deep in West Africa of development and change at the community level. So Francis, please uh, take it away. The other two panelists will be um, Celine de Cruz, uh, extraordinary uh, community organizer that will show you uh, new ways in which communities, particularly in India and in Asia, are creating processes of co-design. And Rajiv Kathpalia, another extraordinary architect uh, based in India, uh, working with some of the uh, most interesting environments in that country, which of course is crucial for uh, global urban development and sustainability. So Francis, please join me and uh, get us started. everybody, welcome. Um, I am a very positive person. So, you know, if you know my career and you see me today connected to the Norman Foster Foundation, then you understand that I have a reason to be positive. Um, of course, I came from Burkina Faso. The place where I grew up, I belong to the very first to have attained education, primary education. My father was a visionary person. He wanted me to learn how to write and read. And this is why I'm here, so I am positive. Because today in my village, I can tell you less than 50% of the population are still neither able to read nor write. In this time of globalization, in this time of smartphones, in this time of super speed internet. But I'm positive because there is still a lot of work for me to do. In some places, people are complaining. Where there is a lot to do, there is a lot of positivism. Um, let me show you what I have started to do. Um, when I started, there was no money. I have been everywhere in Germany asking for initiative to support my work. People were surprised where it's you trying to improve the quality of li life of people in your country and not the government. I understood that I didn't know my community, my environment, the political system. So I went back to build with my community to try to change, to make a change. This here is a little team of my community. This is a little team of my, my, my team, my worker. Those ladies are the background of my community. In the scale of Africa, those women are the backbone. Without these women, there is no Africa. There is no development. So today, this is um, where we're coming from. Level zero of urban settlement. Ouagadougou, the capital city of Burkina Faso. Here is evident. We get in touch with the power. This power was so powerful that it, it could impose everything, even urban structure. Here is evident. They were not to create a sort of modernity, but what is missing are public spaces for the people, green areas. But what we did, we love it so much that we just copy it. We keep spreading it. You can see it in Lagos. You can see it in uh, Niamey. 
Abidjan, Accra, Lomé, Bamako, Dakar. Just talking about West Africa. And we see the rise of informal settlements. This is where people can find better jobs, the cities. Everyone goes and tries to build his own house. This is why we have informal settlements in these places. So that is the result. But for me, it's a source of inspiration, of innovation. Then it gives me a job to do. You know, if you follow the political debate, you suddenly see there is a competition around Africa. To which block does Africa belong? Long, long time ago, it was about the Soviet Union and then the West Bloc. Today, even Europe is complaining where is the place in Africa for, for Europe. The US and China are competing on Africa. For me, as a designer, I often ask myself, why don't they join us to put effort to create instead of fighting, instead of choking? So I love this picture because it's evident what's happening. More speaking, more criticism than actions. And one of the biggest issues is a criticism that Africa is selling itself to China. We want to be colonized by China. I'm asking myself, why this criticism? Where are the so-called friends of Africa centuries ago? Why didn't put the, didn't put effort to help the continent overcome, you know, the poverty, create infrastructure? I think that is a big reason to be positive. If we push and encourage young people to carry the weight of the development of the country, continent, then we will have a growth. We will have a continent of hope because this is what we need. Here, Africa is often considered as a weak, sick, with all diseases in the West. Here is the another Africa. The Africa that is willing to build. The Africa that is willing to show that the continent is full of expectation, of opportunities, and not a weak place where everyone complain and try to help. I'm abusing this picture of Moliere because I love it so much. If you trust the community that knows their place the best, then you will build better countries. You will build better communities and no more um, informal settlements, all better popular settlements. Thank you very much. Mine is a story of the city of Mumbai where I grew up and where uh, you have about six million households living in slums and on the streets. But this is a short story of what marked me as and my career and the beginning of a huge movement of slum dwellers all over Africa and Asia. And it's called the Slum Dwellers International in Africa and Asian Coalition for Housing Rights in the Asian region. In Mumbai, you have about 6 million slum dwellers, 30,000 families lived on the streets. And they, they were basically not citizens. And so this is a story of how these pavement dwellers were able to negotiate with the city in a land where the prices are as high as Tokyo and New York, and it's impossible to get a house. So you're not only not a slum dweller, you don't live on a piece of land, you're on the street, so you're basically a nobody. And the fact that you were able to create an, a movement of these people and find houses for them and now have a policy for them for pavement dwellers in the city is a huge thing. So you're talking about uh, communities without land, without finances, without any 
resources to put together anything. And like we all know in the architectural world, these three things actually create the bulk of the expenditure of your house. You need your land, you need uh, finances to construct your house, and you need an architect you can afford who can design your house. Now the poor don't have all these three things. So, so, so where do you begin with a group of people like this living on the street? So we actually started with the house that they lived in, which was a two by three square feet house, or four by four, or maybe two by one. And you see, at the most, they had the luxury of extending the house vertically. But you're talking about 10 to 20 people living in that small space. And how does that happen? Because that space converts into different kind of spaces during the day and night. During the day, you socialize, you cook, you have your bath there. The men have their bath outside. The women wash their clothes. Your friends come and visit you inside. You may have a little TV in that little space. So what we did was actually get women to take the same design and stretch it into different, and stretch that two by four house into a 10 by 15 square feet house with a loft area. And so they were able to negotiate for something that was affordable and something that the city would be ready to recognize and give it to them. There is no piece of land in the city of Bombay. Everything is full, everything is dense. So where do you begin? We looked at the master plan and we saw that actually the lands that were demarcated for low cost housing or housing for the economically weaker had a cigarette factory on it. And that's when you realize that if the powerful can play around with the master plan, why not the poor? But we had needed to get our act together and we needed to organize ourselves. And so the communities actually went and we had picnics on every single vacant piece of land and understood what that land would mean in terms of finding a job, in terms of commuting to their old place of work, if they had to take transport, what it would cost them. And all the questions that we as middle class people ask when we move homes so that the poor never have a right to ask. So land was one area. The second area was money and finance. We all know nobody talks to you. No bank will talk to you if you don't have any credit history or any savings in your account to be able to go and negotiate for a loan. So that was the second thing that we did. We actually got the poor communities to organize and save money. Your little one rupee a day is never going to give you a house in this lifetime. But when you're a collective, and the whole city comes together and all the slum dwellers come together and you're putting that one dollar a day or one rupee a day, you're able to leverage our external finance resource, uh, external housing finance. So we were able to do that with the banks, with Citibank, with all these guys. No money in your pocket, but we had a track record of showing that people can save and that they can repay a loan if they can get it back. And we were only able to do that because Large, large amounts of communities actually got organized. The third important part was actually doing, so this is the example of doing it citywide. And when you do it citywide, your leverage is much bigger because you're able to then talk to the city about the big picture and not just my settlement and give me houses for 30 people. And that's exactly what this movement has been doing in the last 30 years of how to do the specific but actually use the, spe the specific thing to get governments to change their behavior and policy. And not just policy, to change behavior, because we've seen we've all got beautiful policies, but we're not able to translate that on the ground or implement it on the ground. The third part, of course, was the housing design. And most of these women couldn't read and write. So they took their saris, which was five and a half yard, multiplied it by three, and that's how they got the length and the breadth of their house. They took their chains, which was a foot long, and they used that as a measuring tape to actually design their first house model. And they didn't do the little beautiful models that most architects do, because poor people don't understand ratios in those little models. They actually built a life-size model. They built three life-size models, and they had an exhibition, and they all voted for the house that they most liked. And one of them was just a ground structure of 10 by 5. Another was a ground plus one structure. And the third one just had more area. So, so, so communities sat together and actually worked through these different options. And they were able to show architects and engineers that it's completely possible to demystify architecture and to be able to take this whole house design to another level of actually strengthening and building their movement. Thank you.
Uh, okay, so the question is that where do slum dwellers come from? And I think uh, we assume that they come from some other planet. Actually, they come from villages, right? And they come from villages that have either been engulfed by the city or are going to be engulfed by the city or they're from faraway villages. But they have built their own villages. So they have a background to what do they do? How do they build? And so the question that came for us was that when you start looking at slums, you start looking at village organizations, you start looking at um, the systems that go about making slums. And uh, yes. So uh, I call them homegrown cities, actually. Uh, and OK, so, so we come from a place which is rather complex. I mean, you don't know which century you're in, in the 12th century or the 21st century. All of it exists simultaneously in our context. And villages, cities, uh, so is this rural and urban divide that we talk about actually exist? Because you have cattle in our cities, you have farms growing in our cities, and vice versa, so there's a mix of things. And so we looked at what is the things that make these kinds of places. <clears throat> so the perspective that we're sort of putting together is that if you follow the standard way of going about our cities, we're going to have this, lots of cars, lots of people, standard ways of looking at it. But if you start challenging this paradigm and start thinking about a future which may be entirely different, which is invented by the local systems that exist, we may invent a different kind of a city, which is entirely different from what's happened so far. And so, um, you know, it's interesting that the number of deaths that take place by traffic accidents are much higher than what happens by disease, et cetera, in our thing. So urban planning becomes enemy number one of our population. Now, what we're looking at is that how does uh, different aspects of the city come together, urban plans come together? So technology is something that we talk about smart cities and we talk about the fact that, you know, that is, if you're going to monitor everything, that is going to make it much more functional as a city. But as a matter of fact, things like natural features and climate make a greater difference. Things like infrastructure that's put in place, like roads, et cetera, shape the city and shape our culture. Uh, and buildings and architecture change quite frequently, and uh, occupation changes much more frequently. So what are these life cycles that we're talking about? And I call them, from the tip of the iceberg, you see the depths of things that are going to be taking place. So we are looking at reuse and replenishment cycles of how landscape and soil, urban form and layout, technology changes and changes our behavior. Essentially, all these are interconnected. And uh, we propose a shift in planning from short cycles to these long cycles, which are going to really make a difference. And if you start looking at the way water is managed, um, where, where uh, divisions of roads are managed, etc. divisions of farms are managed, I think we come back to issues of what is appropriate and ingenious to the place to be used out there. There seems to be some problem with the way this changes, but anyways. Uh, so we say, if you've got to carry satellite dishes and camel carts, then so be it, as long as they serve the purpose. And so we are advocating a successful integration between the rural countryside and its systems with the, with the way that urban these things change. We found an interesting thing that urban blocks, actually the rural land holdings and the urban blocks have the same perimeter. So when you start converting this, then I think if you can use those, you'll save a lot of trees, you'll save a lot of embankments, 
and you'll actually get a much more functional city than you would get if you were doing it on a clean slate. So when we look at these systems as layers, different layers of structure that form it, uh, shouldn't the green water bodies become the public space around which public spaces are created? Shouldn't the landscape become participants to all of this to make something that is much more appropriate what exists? So we call smart urbanization as having choices. So like our thali that you can make and mix your own mix out there, that's really essentially what we are talking about. Thank you. So we'll follow by um, a little bit of a conversation. Everything is a little bit quick, but um, I want to emphasize, uh, please join us here, Francis. Um, so to me, uh, you know, your presentations gave me hope, but a lot of my knowledge of what's happening, uh, particularly in Africa and India, which anyone would consider the most uh, difficult, challenging places, are also the places of great opportunity and invention. So I wanted to ask you a little bit around not just helping people in the human angle, but in terms of fundamental ways in which we design. We design communities, space, neighborhoods. Tell us about fundamental innovations that you see are happening in Africa or in India that may inform sort of a community that's interested in, in architecture and design uh, and uh, has seen only uh, uh, models that of participatory planning in the US and Europe. So uh, I'll start with you, Francis. How do you see this process and how do you see it's different? First, I would love to say that it is important to try to learn from the community. So what is available? Material is the first choice. And how you can teach people, how you can train, uh, in my case. Um, when I started, my community was like surprised because uh, um, to learn how to build, uh, you have to follow your father, your, 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 your grandfather, your grandmother to see lifelong what they're being doing before be able to do that. And then I came with the training from Germany and I wanted to do to be able, and I was young. So they didn't believe, you know. First, where where can he get all of this knowledge? And I started to demonstrate a little example. In my case, I was happy enough to take the oldest. One oldest in my village was especially important. If he says no, everything is no. Mm -hmm. Even more than the chief, who was my father. Um, I, I, you know, I try to take clay, I improve you know, the, the, the content, I make bricks that was resistant to water, and that was already a miracle. So some of you will say it's a voodoo, it's a magic. So education is just opening another horizon mm -hmm. for those kind of uh, people living at the age of uh, development. Right. So the material is important and education is important and then you have to innovate. You have to get the people be involved. If you get them be part of it, then they will know to appreciate the, 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 the innovation that you are introducing. That will make it their own. That is how I, I do build. Yeah. But I think it's an emphasis innovation really oh, yes. starts also from history and place. Yeah. but also brings the best knowledge from around the world. So this is sort of a theme that we've been discussing all week. Adaptation, exactly. adaptation, not to take what is like good in Madrid and bring it to Gando. Right. No, I'm not talking about Gando here in, a, in the Canary Island. I'm talking <laughs> about Gando in Burkina Faso. So Celine, uh, I, I've known you for a long time and part of the things that have been blowing me away is how the communities that Celine described actually have been creating their own evidence, their own way of advocating for what they see as their priorities, but by creating their own census. Uh, in many ways, supplanting and turning the tables on government and government agencies. So tell us a little bit about that and how, what do you think uh, is, is innovative about that and whether that could be scaled to many other places in the world. Yeah, in our work we quickly realized that we couldn't be happy with just one little sweet project and, you know, or two projects and that we actually needed to scale it up. If, all the urban poor in the world need to benefit from it. So the whole strategy has been around looking at the most difficult situations. So I don't think any college of social work or not social work or architecture 
teaches you how to design in a two by three square feet area. How do you design a house in that little space? It's a challenge. Maybe you all should have a competition at the Norman Foster Foundation to check out how you do that. And this is this ingenious of how these people actually take the minimum space on the street and are able to do this. But soon they realized that in, to talk to government and engage government, they actually needed to go with the blueprint and they had to go with a bigger picture and they had to collect information about themselves. And they couldn't go and say, poor us, give us a house. It had to be different. It had to be, here is our design. This is the design for 100 families. If we multiply it throughout Dharavi, through 430 acres of land, this is what is possible. These are the options. 800 people use one toilet. Can we bring down that ratio to 20 people to one toilet? So practical examples and practical ways which actually doesn't make government lose face, but allows government to engage you and into a dialogue that also makes them feel, OK, this is workable, this is doable. But it needs two hands to clap. And you cannot. So, so we have realized that housing is just not a technology issue, that it is a political issue, and that you have to be able to, and no party politics has ever put this on their agenda, and therefore the whole trust is in creating a voice and identity of the very poor in cities who collect their own information and collect their own finances to be able to engage government. Thank you, Sunil. So this leads to the question then of, with all this information and ways of really teaming up to, with communities, how do you design uh, with a community? Who's the designer? Is it the architect? Is it the community? How does the process work, right? And I, I'm very encouraged by the environments that I see in India and West Africa as to what's happening. But for you, Rajiv, you know, who's the designer? You know, uh, how do you also design for a process of development, not just for a static uh, uh, environment where you're delivering maybe services or improving housing, but for a process that's open-ended and needs to produce results over time, right? You have all your scales. How is it that design becomes that at that scale, and what is the architecture of that? But I think, firstly, it's a very open-ended kind of a situation where when you're engaging with government, you're engaging with their standards and norms and methods to go about it, and you're talking about innovation at that level. On the other side, you're talking about people who build, so you facilitate them. You're actually a facilitator to bring all these people together rather than sort of act as the designer who knows everything, because you're learning from all sides, and all, I think the only skills that you have is to be able to communicate these ideas to a whole set of people and say that, okay, how do we move from here to here? This is what the government wants. The government one says that I have these rules that I have to follow. So for instance, talking about toilets, uh, they said our standards say that they have to be community toilets. We know community toilets don't work at all because nobody maintains them. So we said, supposing you did community toilets which you divided up into four parts, and each part belonged to a household. And that household then took care of their own. So it's the same cost. So can we do something like that? And that sort of went through the rules. So that's the kind of innovation that sort of takes place of being working within the system and subverting quietly. Mm -hmm. That is where innovation is, isn't it? It's at the core of it. We'll, we'll say a little bit more about innovation in the next panel as well. One of the things that's impressed me in a lot of this work is how technology sometimes it's used, right? It's not you know, the efficiency of the city that a large company may come in and try to drive everything perfectly. In India, that's almost unthinkable in West Africa. It's really about the ways people design, communicate, find evidence, exchange evidence, and create almost political spaces where they can negotiate the same map, right, as a future that's a shared future. So uh, that seems very interesting. Do, do you use... Um, do you use any of those uh, um, um, technologies in your design process, Francis or, or, or Rajiv? How do you communicate and design yeah. together, and how do you hold on to those ideas and build upon them? No, if you, if, if you have a, a good example that is working well, people come to see, mm -hmm. later it's easier to communicate. Mm -hmm. uh, it's about the fear about the new thing. So it's not just in Africa, it is also here. Mm -hmm. uh, you know. And uh, what we do is often to try to just make, and then you can explain. Mm -hmm. Just first do the, uh, create a, a precedent that is good, that is working. You know, when I, I started, for example, my work, uh, I'd, I had some time to meet official. At the end, I realized that I was the only one that understand the need of my community and can act. So I did it. Now it happened to me 
that I met a lot of people say, okay, you know, I was former this, former this, and former that, and uh, you know, I understood. Now I understand what he was uh, uh, doing. And if I had money, I will let you do my, my house. Uh, <laughs> and great. so, you know. That's the real uh, litmus test. Yeah, and yes, <laughs> later you can. Like uh, I now today with the devices, I am communicating with my people. No, there is something that the West is not aware about. Uh -huh. People really? love technology. Right, really. Right. In Burkina. Now I'm communicating with my construction people. As soon we have internet connection with WhatsApp. You cannot imagine how you could just change some uh, painting on the sign, taking pictures, sending to me, and I'm, so my, my, my iCloud backup is always full, you know, because I'm getting back and forward, even sitting in the aircraft, mm -hmm. using all of these to just do, and then uh, uh, people are open to mapping what we have seen yesterday, the, all of these great things. It has to be at a reach, and people have to learn how to use them, and you have to trust people, the community, I mean. So they're probably watching us now uh, in your project. So I hope not. So I will get a lot of emails and, yeah. and SMS and messages. I'll show you. Right. Patron, patron, I'll show you. What was you telling? <laughs> yeah. But there is a role for architects, and I feel uh, I don't want to glorify what poor communities do on their own. They can do a little bit, and they can right. tell us what their aspirations are. But you are ultimately the ones who are going to translate it into a yeah. blueprint. And we've seen example over example where you're Young architects have played such an important role in bringing this change and as partners in this process. So in the south of Thailand, a whole community along the seaside in Songkla was supposed to be evicted. And then this group of young architects sat together and worked out this beautiful blue, you know, print, blueprint with a promenade and a street corner and a place where people could continue to stay. And in the evenings, the rest of the city could come for some fresh air. Mm -hmm. And the city was so impressed that we were able to give them an option that they didn't think about. So I feel this is the magic of working together because we can't do it on our own. Communities cannot do this on their own. But when you put your stamp on it, and when you go as a professional and say this is possible, the city is ready to listen. So I urge you all to partner more with such projects. So I think now we're going to do a bit of an experiment, which is to open up for one or two questions for this panel. Um, are we ready with the microphones? OK, great. So uh, I can kind of see you, but it's bright. So are there one or two questions from the audience? Please put your arm up, and you may get a microphone. Um. <laughs> You're very shy. Um, let's see. I think we have a question. Oh, there's a question here. Well, first of all, I'm from Bolivia, and we have such a same thing there. We, as a people, we as a population, think that segmentations of these kind of communities or, or slums mm. are not like inviting to grow a city. But instead, I'm working on a project that says, well, that states how could one settlement of an Uruchipaya community, that's like a millennial ancient community in Bolivia, will become like prosperous without being like eaten by the government, you know? So is that the question? Yeah. How, how can that happen? Do you, anyone wants to comment? How do you get prosperous without being eaten by the government? <laughs> no. no, I mean, all of this is about empower, empowerment, you know? Um, and then visibility. Uh, Jen was telling yesterday, if you are visible, uh, people, uh, you know, people cannot aggress you. And uh, what I couldn't say here, I had to finish. I had to say, you know, if you trust the community, like I was uh, doing many, many years, and you get successful, people will trust you. I think if we consider the fact that people, by living in a given environment, they know the places very well, you know, and they know the needs. And if we highlight this and allow them to grow and to fit the needs that are wanted, and then the government will not eat them. At the end, in my story, uh, really what I was trying to say, I'm meeting a lot of former ministers that didn't have, uh, you go for a meeting, you will wait 
for half a day, and you go. And then, you know, I was studying when I started my work. I had to go back to Ouagadougou and to Gando to work, and then I had to wait for a mayor and whatever. And at the end, I stopped. And all of these people has now discovered what I have been doing, the importance for the community, and then they will project. It may be late for this, but for me not. It is a lot of work to do, and for you, I will say you there is no recipe. Every place is different. You have to go and dig deeper mm. and hope that foundation like the Norman Foster Foundation just support you opening their network, you know? And they, but you have to do, it's your job, not we here. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, Norman, you're okay? Norman has prerogative. I'm, <clears throat> I'm not going to ask a question, um, but I do find myself frequently saying to people around me, that it's very important, perhaps, to state the obvious. And I just want to say something about the three individuals who are comprising this panel. First of all, Francis did not show you the products of his team, those ladies. <clears throat> He's creating the most exquisite, beautiful works of architecture out of local materials and unbelievable teams of the community. And when I engaged with the slum in Odisha and met the ladies who were representing that community, it was only over dinner last night, sitting next to <laughs> you, that I realized that you had created with the institute that you've co-founded, that community spirit. So that group was able to communicate and engage as a result of your initiative. And two weeks ago, I was at the Vitra Center just outside Basel. There was an exhibition of the work of Doshi. And you're a partner of Doshi. And the kind of projects that you're doing for poor communities is extraordinary. So because I didn't feel that maybe, I'm sure many in the audience know that, but perhaps not everybody. So I thought it was important to say that. Thank you. Thank you, Norman. Yeah. <laughs> so it's important just to echo that again in so many different ways that the work that's coming out of these environments is not remedial. It's really beautiful, different, innovative, and extraordinary in a way that it should be. But that that's becoming possible and can inspire all of us in Madrid and across the world is a very powerful moment and a moment where uh, the kind of innovation and, and, and change that we're looking for in this workshop becomes possible. I think we have a question from the online audience. Is that right, Mia? Yes. We can't hear you, I'm sorry. Yeah. It's fine, I will speak now. Hello? There yes, we go. Good. Um, Tariq Katantu from Uganda asks, how can Africa evolve its architecture to cope with the world around and instill its heritage? Thank you. I'll start with you, friends. <laughs> how can Africa? <laughs> A little bit slow. Um, how can Africa evolve its architecture to cope with the world around us and instill its heritage? This is a big question, my dear friend from Uganda. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, uh, just be uh, resilient. Just try to save what is important, what can be seen as a basement, to put something new on that without destroying, but winning. And then really try to be open, really, to be open. Uh, you know, if we start to replicate round hats, mm -hmm. like which is our tradition, uh, how to to create place for the growing populations that we have, we're facing too. So we have to learn for sure from the West. Really, we need to learn, but copying is not the right answer here. We have to innovate ourselves, to adapt what we've been seeing, discovering uh, to the reality, the reality of our communities. And it is important to get our communities be involved. Uh, in the West, there is a crisis, but we don't, try to criticize it because we're still weak, you understand? Because we still think the West is the best model. 
we have to critically also ask the way of how things are being done in the West, and then we will find our own way, the African way for our people. And Selina Rajiv, how can India do the same? I think it's um, one because of the kind of each part of India is so different from the others, climatically, socially, culturally, that um, I don't think one solution could fit all in any case. And so therefore, each one has to sort of find their own way through it in this kind of a milieu that we are. And uh, that means an engagement of communities back as citizens, rather than sort of withdrawing and hoping that the government is going to do everything. And I think a lot of communities have realized that the government by itself can't do anything, so they get down to doing things themselves. Mm -hmm. And how do you sort of empower communities to be able to take decisions, to be informed about things? Uh, I think that's where a role of a lot of the NGOs comes in from their basic fundamental rights to uh, technology and uh, how do you organize yourself. All of these become, I think, stepping stones towards uh, making change come about from the inside rather than from the top down. And of course, while this is happening, you have to understand that, um, after all, we are a democracy, the largest democracy in the world. So, I mean, it is no government can stay without this contact also. So I think there's a growing recognition that this has to be a hand-in-hand -hand, uh, sort of movement together, mm -hmm. not, not by one or the other. Celine, last word. Yeah, it, also you need to marry pragmatism along with affordability. And if you're talking of large numbers of people in our cities mm -hmm. who can't afford, we can't think of this beautiful design that, you know, these, so for you a lovely exotic mud house would be grand as an architect. But for a slum dweller, they don't want a mud house. They want a house that, lit, that can stand there for 50 and 60 years. They want something with bricks and cement. So how can you take the present and innovate with that? And I think that's the trick, how to do that without being very out of you know, what cannot be produced in, at scale. Thank you. I still dream of a, a Norman Foster building in some parts yeah. of uh, Mumbai, but that's my own fantasy. So I think maybe it's possible, but we'll see. So uh, please thank the panel again. I hope you were inspired. So we will then uh, basically uh, change gears to the next panel. The next panel will be a little bit more uh, about macroscopic trends of development and urbanization, uh, but with a special vignette into what is human development across generations in Rio de Janeiro. So uh, the first speaker is Ian Golden. So uh, Ian, please join us. It's a huge pleasure to be here and sh share some thoughts on perspective and where we are in the future of cities. What are the issues we're going to be thinking through and how do we deal with this very confusing time of growing complexity that we all face? The key for me, let's get the slides. The key for me is really thinking about this as a time of a new renaissance, an optimistic time, but a time that brings incredible possibilities, but also huge new risks, and we know the Renaissance ended in religious wars with that information revolution. This is about not the death of distance or the world being flat, as was the great dream of that period. Do you have my slides? Uh, or, thank you. Uh, or the end of history, but rather a new significance of place, place being more important than ever. And that's because people are discovering what's happening in these dynamic cities and want to participate. The walls coming down have defined our period. The wall coming down in Berlin 30 years ago, accelerating globalization and leading to the most extraordinary transformation, 65 countries around the world becoming democratic within a five-year period. And it's this process of accelerating change combined with the creation of the World Wide Web, which has created 4.5 billion more literate people in the world. And with that, an extraordinary capability for people and genius to be unlocked around the world. And that's why this is the slowest meeting and time you'll know for the rest of your lives. That's why the pace of change is accelerating. That's why you need to be 
ready and anticipate more dynamism. But not be terrified by it, not be paralyzed by it, embrace it, because that provides new opportunity. It's created two billion more people in the world as ideas have traveled, which are leading people to live longer, healthier lives. And of course, this is all happening in cities. It's the reason why place is more important, people coming together. And of course, it's led to this massive rise of emerging markets growing at three to five times the rate of us old advanced economies. That's the source of dynamism. That's the source of growth. And if the people that are angry about globalization don't live in these places which are doing well, the people that are angry about globalization live in Spain, Britain, France, US, and other advanced economies, which are now finding they no longer run the world. And that's a good thing. It's a good thing that we are sharing power. While the walls have come down between countries, they're going up within countries everywhere. And this is defining the new politics of inequality, the diseases of despair. Place has become more important and getting there and being in the right place more significant than ever. <laughs> that was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> These diseases become the super spreaders of good ideas and bad ideas. And what people are wanting to do, if I can control the slides, is get a grip on it. What we see with climate change, of course, is this dramatic story of transformation. When we're thinking about the future of cities, a key question is where will these cities be in vis -vis ocean rise? And most of the development of cities is in the dynamic places which are coastal. And so thinking about resilience, thinking about the participation of cities in this process is going to be absolutely vital too. The global commons issues, the adding up of all the benefits become more and more important. So we need to think increasingly about each other. We need to realize that the market alone won't provide solutions, that community is the source of the hope for the future. Community within groups of people that live nearby, but also more globally. And of course, in addressing these issues of climate change, we need to remember that most of the world has not yet benefited that most of the world still has to climb the energy curve, that vast parts of the world remain disconnected. And so the solutions that we find need to be solutions which are going to provide opportunities elsewhere. There is no wall high enough that will keep out climate change. These high walls within cities and between cities are the source of the danger, not the opportunity. And what we see in this withdrawal is what worries me most about the future of cities, which is the inability to grasp to grasp this time we're in and work together, to use the source of diversity in the world as a source of strength, the source of diversity which is releasing opportunities we've heard from this wonderful panel before, ideas coming from all over the world, ideas which are now connected, where we can share them in new ways, as Francis was explaining. And as we think about this time and the future of cities, we don't see the borders between countries when we look down on our world. We see this interconnected web. And it's this interconnected web of ideas, of opportunities, of hopes, of challenges, which I believe provides the opportunities to solve the problems of cities for the future. Thank you very much. So today I'm going to talk about urban informality as a solution to the city, not as a problem. And I'm going to talk about the importance of the right to the city. The fundamental question for me is, who is the city for? Is it for the privileged elite? Is it every city going to become the world global city? Or is it for the people who live in that city and what combination of those two? So I'm going to talk about this based on 50 years of research that I've done in the favelas of Rio de Janeiro, and based on 30 years of trying to put into practice the research I've done so that it can make a difference in people's lives in real time, in real space. And that's called the Megacities Project. My Rio research began in 1968. I was quite young, and I lived in several favelas, three to be specific, for six months each in Rio de Janeiro, 
following the migrant stream from the countryside to the city and produced this book, The Myth of Marginality, which argued that marginality is a myth and that the people who come to the city are the best and the brightest and that they are contributing enormous amounts to the city and receiving very little in return. And they are not marginal, but integrated in a rather asymmetric manner. 30 years later, I came back to the city and found over 41% of the original 750 people I interviewed. And um, in that time, the community that I lived in, which was there, had been removed, and everyone had been bussed in garbage trucks to very peripheral public housing projects where there was much less opportunity for work, school, healthcare, or any other thing. And I wrote about that in a second book called Favela, uh, Four Decades of Living on the Edge in Rio de Janeiro. And over the period of time from the first favela in 1897, which was the Mojo de Providencia, till the current moment when my research is still continuing in 2019, many different public policies have been tried. Some were based on the myth of marginality and said that people were garbage, they were dirty, they were useless, and they should be eradicated like a cancer. So that was the policy of removal into public housing, very ugly public housing. Then there was a period after the end of the dictatorship when people embraced the idea that favelas could integrate in the city and they should be upgraded on site. And that's the picture of Favela Baido in 85 to 2008. And um, the lead up to the big events, the mega events, which included the World Cup in 2014 and the Olympics in 2016, many public policies were put into place to kind of um, pacify the city. So they had a pacifying police force that occupied the favelas 24 seven and created a increasing violence and increasing abuse of human rights. But they also tried to have some slum upgrading which easily deteriorated when they gave up on it. And then they used the excuse of the mega events to bring back a brutal policy of removal. 77,000 people were removed and in the meantime, the young people were documenting their own history, interviewing the elders, creating museums in their communities, and doing all kinds of acts of hope and resistance. Whoops. So um, the final book that I'm writing now of this favela trilogy is called A Importancia de Ser Gente, which means the importance of personhood. And it's really all about human rights, dignity, and respect, that nobody should be Un disrespected because of where they live or what kind of life they live. And it's part of an all long-term struggle in cities for human rights, suffrage, for all the rights of women. And right now the youth, the youth in the favelas and the peripheral areas of the cities are the ones joining and taking the lead because of their new communications technologies to look for a future plan for their city. And my argument now is, don't bother trying to give land tenure, it doesn't work. No new place recognizes it. It has to be a new kind of collective tenure. But in the meantime, would the governments please invest in human and social capital and stop thinking that public works and buildings and infrastructure and even design is going to solve the problem when really people need to be able to have jobs and they can do a lot of these things their own. Of course, with help from professionals, but this massive investment in um, public works has not shown to be durable or sustainable or fair. So 50 years later, favela residents are still fighting for respect, dignity, and voice. And then to just end with a few words about the Megacities Project, I, um, when I left teaching at Berkeley, I started a nonprofit to shorten the lag time between research and policy or between ideas and implementation because it took 25 years for many, many researchers who had written in the 60s and 70s against removal to have that put into public policy. So I created a network of teams in each of the megacities because I thought megacities were the nodes of innovation. They were so dense and so diverse. And the megacities goal was to shorten this lag time and to bridge theory and practice. We are 30 years into it now. We've uh, found about, well, hundreds and hundreds of innovations in each city, 
and had a marketplace of ideas where the ones that are needed by one city can we send the people from that city to learn about that and go back and implement it in their own way, in their own culture. And right now, our, new, our newest and most exciting, for me, uh, iteration of megacities is called Megacities times Mega Changes, MC times MC, MC squared. It's energy, and it's all about young people being the next generation with their new ideas and new technologies and standing on the shoulders of their elders so they can see further away and being able to take the next step with the elders opening the doors for them and the collaborating intergenerationally, multidisciplinary, and collaboratively. And this final slide is the, uh, at Habitat 3 in Quito in 2016, October, where we gave, the Megacities Project gave six awards. One of the awardees is here, Mercedes Bidart. Two people from all over the world who were young, emerging urban leaders doing extraordinary things that could either be scaled up into public policy in those cities where the policy makers were open to it or be transferred like wildfire from one leader to another, community to community, ignoring the urban government or the state or the national government. So here we are rewarding these urban leaders and they are celebrating the future. Thank you very much. Greetings, it's a great honor to uh, be at the Norman Foster Foundation and to address this audience. Uh, I'm a bit of an odd duck here, not only because I'm following five absolutely inspirational talks, and maybe mine will be less so, I'm not using a uh, PowerPoint, uh, but also I'm a macroeconomist. I look at uh, truly things from a macro perspective. And uh, you may ask why I'm here, uh, it's, there is a, a, a apocryphal story which may be true or not about the Russian military parade with all the big missiles going by and all the troops marching. And then there's some men with beards and uh, their notebooks and they're walking by and the general, one of the generals says to the other, what are they doing here? And the general says, oh, they're economists. Have you ever seen how much damage they can do? Um, <laughs> And certainly there are large uh, uh, economic issues here um, that are affecting the, uh, what's going on in cities that are driving things. Uh, you see projections from the World Bank, from McKinsey about urban eco economies getting bigger and bigger, cities getting bigger and bigger. And that might be true, but I think it's worth remembering these things have gone in waves. When the railroad was invented, yes, that happened. But when the auto was invented, things spread out. Now they're moving back together, really driven by information technology, driven by innovation. But there are tremendous incentives to think of innovation that allow people maybe not to live in rural areas, but in much more, uh, in, in many more uh, concent different concentrated areas than just in a, in, a, in a few cities. Certainly for the moment, these forces of agglomeration are very powerful. The internet was in, invented, you were supposed to be able to commute from your house 300 miles away and not have to go to work. But in fact, face-to-face -face meetings became more important than ever. Uh, the, the work, the productivity in cities is greater. And frankly, this is true at a global scale. The United States and China simply dominate tech, partly because of size. Uh, Europe, Africa, uh, Latin America, virtually nowhere to be seen except that they're all working in Silicon Valley uh, or, or somewhere else. So there are these huge challenges uh, co coming, uh, coming forward. Uh, I think the answers we have to them are pretty straightforward. Uh, you need to build infrastructure, you need to provide education, lifetime education because people's jobs will change, you need to provide health, you need to provide clean water. Economists have other answers like carbon taxes or congestion taxes. And trust me, based on my experience, almost no politicians ever want to hear about these things, but I think they lie in the future. Uh, there is innovation coming in the private sector uh, and, for example, in financial markets, uh, Kenya, South Africa have remarkable innovation that's provided more uh, financial inclusion. As 
something closer to my own area of work, these innovations in financial markets sometimes don't end well. Uh, I wrote a book called, with Carmen Reinhart called This Time is Different about the history of financial crises. Um, and I don't need to tell this audience that housing markets are often at the core uh, of these crises. And Spain, of course, has just had a, a, a horrific one. I think there are potentially problems in the future, maybe coming from China. Just as I said, it's very hard to extrapolate what's going into the future when you're talking about uh, the growth of urban areas. Everybody says China is just going to grow and grow and grow. And I'm, I'm not so sure. I think there are a lot of reasons that it may slow down, having to do with demographics, having to do with uh, decreasing returns to investment. It, ha it has as much housing per square as much square meters per capita as most cities, most places in Europe now. Uh, and it's a much poorer country. Uh, it can't keep catching up. So I would, I, I would say that you know, if I look out at the risks to this environment, there are these very big macro risks, uh, China potentially having a problem with housing. And then finally, a question of, well, how do we proceed in this environment? Uh, economists like myself like markets, but you need planning. And there's this tremendous debate going around about do autocracies work better? Was democracy wrong? Should we all be more like China? And I think this is a, a, a huge debate about capitalism versus uh, socialism, how much central planning should you have. Um, certainly, the poster child for what not to do would be Venezuela, the richest country in Latin America uh, in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s. Today, it has a 90% poverty rate. It's just in a state of uh, complete uh, collapse. So I, uh, surrounding the, these issues at a micro level, you need to keep a macroeconomic environment that fosters growth. Thank you. So just as before, we're going to have uh, start a conversation with the panel and then uh, think of questions this time. So I've asked you in advance. Um, so I think that um, you see how the kind of discussions we've been having this week and how approaching them from different places, different scales, really informs sort of a much richer picture of what our process of development and uh, both what can go well and uh, be a source of optimism, but also in many ways warnings and, and times and places where it hasn't gone well. So I think my first question for the panel is really about that. Um, I, I share your optimism, Ian, of thinking about global trends of innovation, of growth, of uh, human development. Uh, but the question I think that you all touched on is a little bit who benefits from development? We know it tends to be uh, quite unequal, particularly in informational economies, uh, which are also urban economies. Uh, and you know, what, what are good models, or how do we manage this growth such that it does produce all the good things that we hope for, but somehow mitigates some of the issues that uh, Janice or, uh, or Kenneth uh, were bringing up as well, as sort of warnings of uh, growth gone somewhat wrong. So Ian, do you want to start? All right. When things change more quickly, people get left behind more quickly. And so we do need to worry more about the rate of renewal of our societies, but also particularly of those being left behind. And what we're seeing in the current politics in Europe, in the UK, where people in the north of England are poorer now than they were before the financial crisis, in the Midwest of the US, where they're poorer before, than before the financial crisis. If people aren't happy, they'll stop change. Um, we would not have Brexit, we would not have Trump without the financial crisis. Uh, but it's the pace of change of some benefiting and some not benefiting. Across the world, there's been this huge leap in improving, improving incomes. Most emerging markets, most people are doing better off, but there's still a lot of people over $2 billion under $2 a day, and that's obviously a global catastrophe. So yes, there's only one solution as far as I'm concerned, which is more social inclusion and tax and spend. And when you look at Europe and you look at the different countries and see how they've responded to the financial crisis, when you look across the world, that it's about governments becoming more active and, and 
private firms giving back more, paying more tax, registering their tax, the offshoring of tax of individuals and of companies is a big part of the problem of globalization. Governments are losing their tax revenue base. So I believe that inequality is a massive issue. Uh, I believe we need to worry about it more, and I believe the owner answer is that we need to give back more. So Janice, if, if we look at uh, the, the richness of the life stories that you followed and described to us in, in Rio, can you imagine what could have been different if uh, what Ian was just telling us about, different mechanisms to uh, harness growth, think about inequality, uh, dignity of life? Um, what can we learn from, from all, all your work? Well, in that sense? Um, I had a specific idea of what could be different in the lead up to the mega events. Mm -hmm. And I proposed it, which was when they first heard about this in 2008, mm -hmm. Brazil won the bid and Rio won the bid for the World Cup and the Olympics. I thought, well, it's going to be in Rio and here's an opportunity to make a jobs bank of every single job that's going to be needed in order to host the Olympics. Mm -hmm. All the translators, all the drivers, all the cooks, all the tour guides, all the, everything, um, people building stadiums, people maintaining it. Why not make this list available first to anyone who lived in a favela? Mm -hmm. And anyone who lived in a favela who wanted the lower skilled jobs, maybe they could learn them in a year or two and then they would be on a track guaranteed to do that. But there was plenty of time between 2008 and 2016 to learn many more skilled jobs. So there's an example, I, uh, when I was teaching at Berkeley, they had some development in Oakland which gave priority to the workers in Oakland. So I had the idea that any opportunity that comes along, there would be a, a pipeline of, really, of people who were educated knowing that there was something at the other end and they weren't just gonna lose it. The, another idea I had was to change the mentality of the population. If the population doesn't accept squatter removal or doesn't accept this high level of inequality which leads to a high level of violence, policymakers can't really do it. And so I've been thinking a lot about what do you do to show the rest of the world, policymakers but also the general public, what those of us on these panels have seen when we've lived in squatter settlements or slums, how brilliant and resilient and incredibly competent the people are. And I decided one idea could be why not everyone who goes to a private school in high school in order to graduate each year has to partner with one person from a public school and do a joint project or else they can't graduate, no matter how much money their parents have. And they have to be able to know each other as humans. And then in university, the same thing. And then in jobs. I, there are just so many things that can be done by exposure and media, the people who lived in Catacumba who were exposed to the rich people in their early years had a lifelong advantage over generations in how to move up in socioeconomic status because they interacted, they knew how to speak, they went to the better schools, they got better uh, health care. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, that's only a short answer, I mean a few specifics to stay out of the general right. blah blah as to what direction I think um, and then a commitment to this redistribution has to be voted by a population who has to see the value of what happens when you liberate all this mm -hmm. untapped energy. So Kenneth, do you want to come and sort of, what is sort of this, this political economy of the urban 21st century and housing in particular and its volatility and its power to change cities? Well, I mean, I think there have to has to be more investment in people, investment in infrastructure. You know, people often point to the Scandinavian countries, to Denmark, and say everybody should be like Denmark, that's what we want to be. <laughs> there are five and a half million people, mm -hmm. and it's a lot easier to do. If you live in the United States of 325 million people, much less China or India, you have to devolve power. And to devolve power, you have to evolve economic power. And that means some of the transfers are occurring at the local level. And then that doesn't work as well because New York and California have much more generous uh, transfer systems than anybody else. So everybody moves to New York and California and then it gets worse. Uh, it's, it's very difficult to balance, but there's no question that that's part of the solution. I do think, uh, you know, I, do, I really want to point out lifetime education and not just uh, education in youth. 
the young, young people here are going to be changing their careers many times. The days when you could just pick what you were going to do and keep doing it, even an architect perhaps, uh, you just you know, can't necessarily plan on doing that in the future. And you need, I think the, the government can provide online education, you know, providing ways to teach people. And I don't mean mass classes, I mean simpler things at the moment. So I think there, there's, a, there's a lot of scope to do things like that. Um, but uh, you know, obviously, uh, as Ian said, when the, when the changes are very fast, it's much harder to deal with. Mm -hmm. So one of the things we've been discussing a lot, and that ex is exposed by uh, your three presentations, is this uh, imperative of a certain continuity of good growth, right? That when something good happens, which is typical of uh, uh, what's happening in our cities throughout the world, that often it doesn't, it is not continued, either because of political cycles or because uh, of a financial crisis and other things. At the same time, we've been trying to build uh, mechanisms to enshrine policies for sustainable development that in some sense can play out at the necessary time scale, which tends to be a generation, maybe 10 years, 20 years. So uh, do you want to comment on that? How do we think about that? It's related to some of your comments from before. But how do we uh, actually um, understand the nature of development and therefore can create policies that allow us to better guarantee that we stay with it for long enough for? I think whether it's at the, the lowest level of a community or the highest level of national uh, and, in the end, supranational, people have to feel that they're benefiting, that it's their thing, that they have ownership, and whether it's a village or a country. And the problem we face, particularly in the advanced democracies now, is that people don't feel they own the process. Um, and that's because they can't actually get to where the action is. They can't move to California or New York or to London or to Madrid because they can't afford the property prices because the transport system is more congested and more expensive. And so investments in things like housing, in transport, in education become more and more important for sustainability and for the long term. Otherwise, you have reversals. Of course, you can also create institutions, as the Chinese have done uh, most graphically, uh, that generate the long-term vision. Um, but France has done it very effectively as well. France can plan multi-presidential uh, or multi-cycle. Uh, and you see that with Brussels as well. Brussels is a fantastic example of a supranational that is able to plan uh, on, across generations. So there are ways of doing this in democracies as well as, of course, the autocratic models. It's absolutely vital. But in the end, I think, the only guarantee of long-term sustainability is that people feel that it's happening. And of course, there's the planetary sustainability as well. Right, exactly. so, Janice, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I first I want to say I agree with you. Um, you have to feel ownership, and there has to be continuity. When the government changes, there has to be enough force in the non-government institutions and universities to keep up that momentum. When the head of a big company that was supporting something changes, there has to be enough momentum in the government or the civil society. Um, I was just going to give one example of something that could create a long-term continuity and generate a lot of jobs and help the environment, which is to say the urban infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So in the 12 last years of the 1800s, um, in the Industrial Revolution, all of the infrastructure advances that make our cities do our water supply, our roads, our elevators, our internal combustion engines, our sewage systems, were all more or less put into place and have stayed that way throughout the 20th century, despite the fact that they're very expensive and very resource wasteful. In the meantime, in these 100 years and plus, there's been all kinds of advances in science and technology that allow for re-centralizing some of these functions and decentralizing a lot of other functions. And there's no reason why we can't leapfrog, especially in cities which don't have, which 86% are not connected to sewage systems or don't have garbage collection or don't have clean water. Why not skip the whole 20th century and try out these, some of these decentralized systems that are very light on the environment and very uh, circular instead of linear. Mm -hmm. And then the places that have the least in built infrastructure and the least built out can be in the vanguard. And this will employ lots of people and give an ongoing set of skills, some kind of thinking like that. It's right. not exactly. So for, for all of you who are architects and designers, as we leave this question, 
what are these systems? I think that's an excellent point. We've been discussing this a lot in, with an eye for technology that also allows sustainability. Kenneth, do you want to comment? Yeah, I, just to pick up on the challenges, France is wonderful, but it has some huge problems. First of all, it, has, it does have more redistribution. It basic, by many measures, has the most social redistribution in Europe, even more than the Scandinavian countries. But its income is much, much lower than that of the United States. It has not grown per capita income. It has not grown at nearly the pace the United States has. It's not obvious that you could put in a transfer structure like that, have the kind of innovation. I, my prediction for France is it's going to fade into the sunset. It will look like Japan uh, over the next many decades. And the rise in the world will be China, the United States, maybe the United States, India. So it's a, it's a, it's a very difficult balance to do these things. I mean, I think the prescription is clear, but uh, p politically it's not that easy to do, but also in terms of incentives. There are ways to do it. There are ways to have transfers, I mean, in principle, and have the incentives still be strong. The US doesn't have an inheritance tax, which is insane. Uh, but, um, I, and I don't think that would be very distortionary if we did, uh, but, but it's, quite, it's quite challenging. I mean, I, th I think actually not to, I'm in Europe, Spain, by the way, is the, the darling at the moment of everyone because it seems to have reformed and be growing, but a lot of Europe uh, is, is having uh, huge problems. Right. So, you know, if you're hearing this from France, you have to prove kind of wrong, <laughs> so keep that in mind. So we're going to open it uh, again for uh, questions from the audience. Uh, I think that microphone's there. I see a question here. Um, so who has the microphones? Question here. I think it was the first, and there's a question there. So thank you so much for the, the, the whole panel. This was very interesting. Um, I, I would like to to ask a question that uh, also tackles about uh, informant settlement, but maybe taking another angle. Um, so I'm coming from a country, uh, Lebanon, where, uh, I mean, we know a lot about, I mean, we know a lot, we have a lot of um, informal settlement, but a, a different kind um, related to war, uh, to wars in the region. So with a lot of, uh, with the Palestinian war and now with the Syrian wars. So my question is, um, so how, how can we, uh, in a country like Lebanon, where a third world country, I don't know if we can call it a democracy, can, can, how can we get the, those triggers from the local population and from the government to actually get to, to, to have those um, informal settlement, but uh, cultural informal settlement, because the population don't really accept those uh, settlements, but how can we... I mean, it's a general question, um, <laughs> but I, I was just wondering how, if you guys have any um, general thoughts on how could we, yeah. Do you want to pick that up, maybe? Just like people from their communities by war, and then they come, they're in refugee camps, or they're just settled wherever they can on a border? What, what's the condition? So, the, so actually, when those people are fleeing those countries, they actually have to live all their lives if they stay in Lebanon for most of their lives in those uh, camps. So, so, yeah, I was just wondering how, how, how can we get those triggers to have the local population and government to, to change the, the reality um, in those? Mm -hmm. It's the issue well, of stigma that you're bringing up also yeah. in terms of favelas, I think. Yeah, I think there's a, a huge mental set of stigma for people who are living in these camps, but I think it also has to do with what my colleagues on the panel have said. It, it has to be something in the self-interest of the broader population because no one really does anything purely altruistically. And luckily for us, the more people that are involved and the more interconnections there are, the better the pie expands and it doesn't stay to be a narrow pie. So if there could be um, a skills bank for everyone there, what did they used to do and work? How much education do they have? Can they teach a language? Can they learn a language? The whole thing has to be turned about is all of a sudden we have a resource here that um, we don't know anything about. So let's see what this resource can provide to help mm -hmm. the whole surroundings. If it's just let's put money in there, it's going to be um, terrible. And I think part of it is to create small businesses, create local economies, create interactions between the other communities around. 
and start to have like success stories in the newspaper and the magazine. This person who came from here and was in the settlement is now done this and they've, their children are doing that. Something along the line of an upward spiral instead of a downward spiral. Mm -hmm. My whole theory for megacities, take despair and turn it into hope. Try to find a can-do attitude, even if it's the smallest victory, and then everyone said, well, we could do that. I mean, I saw them do that there. We, so it's, for me, a lot has to do with what your mindset is. And of course, they will talk a lot more about I, the structures. Thank you, Jennifer. I'll just add to that, that if you look at what's going on in Venezuela, four million people have left at least already. There are estimates that if Maduro stays in power, it'll be seven million by the end of this year, a country of 30 million. Uh, the Colombia in particular has absorbed a lot of these people very generously. I mean, their problems and issues, they provide them health care. They've been an increase in the labor force by, you know, three and a half percent. But, uh, you know, and, and Colombia has, has benefited in many ways. And part of why Colombia is doing that is when Colombia was having its guerrilla war, Venezuela mm -hmm. absorbed them. But unfortunately, that's, you know, not, not the dynamic in, in the Middle East, but it, it can happen. Right. Ian, you wanted to comment also on the topic of migration. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, there's just so much to say, and we've only got a few minutes. But firstly, you know, a third of Lebanon refugees, it's outsize uh, carrying its weight. Secondly, 95% of refugees are in neighboring countries around the world, although Europe worries a lot about it. The US closes the door as well. Um, clearly, that solidarity needs better. And thirdly, the experience of all countries in the world is that refugees and migrants are the source of dynamism for countries going forward. And if one can absorb that, you look at any data set you look at, you look at startups, you look at Nobel Prize winners, you look at any data set, and you get this outsized contribution of migrants. And I think that's really about understanding uh, and trying to generate an understanding that this is an opportunity. But what you're doing in Lebanon is just quite outsized contribution to, to this. And I think that needs global uh, sharing as well. OK, Ian, thank you. So I think this last question, I think, is from over here. I don't know if we have a microphone that can come over here quickly. Microphone uh, here in the middle, here in the middle. Um. <laughs> it's a little tricky. So you have the last question. <laughs> thank you. First of all, I would like to thank you, to thank the Norman Forster Foundation to have this kind of debates. And I think even Paris, London, I don't know if they are so, so happy as having them. <laughs> People here, I think we are all very lucky. And uh, finally, the problem our planet is having these days is a lack of consciousness. So my question would be, you are talking about long-term sustainability education, education for life. Mm -hmm. But the kind of education we have been having, all of us, doesn't seem enough. So my question is, how do you think we could raise the level of consciousness in our planet mm -hmm. so that we can do everything we want to all of us here to do? Thank you. I'll ask you three brief answers. Kenneth, you, you were really talking a lot about education and human capital. <laughs> so I'll put you on the spot. <laughs> No, I, I, I mean, uh, that's, that's a very challenging question. I, uh, on, honestly, uh, I'm a positive person, but I don't have a good answer. We have inspirational leaders. We have a lot of leaders who are not inspirational. We might have one <laughs> in my country. Uh, so I, but I, I agree with you. You need the will to want to do things. You have to have, as Jana said, people have to feel like it's in their self-interest to do things, that's really been, been the challenge. Janice, um, quick answer. <laughs> I think one of the things about um, changing the consciousness is that in everyday life, there are lots of examples of the consequences of your actions. And I will take Curitiba as a very interesting city, just in one short sentence, in order to motivate recycling. Then anyone who brings down their recycled trash because the trucks can't go up to these squatter settlements, gets a free bus pass. Anyone who takes a certain kind of course gets a free something else. If you, if you, um, every place there is to buy paper, it shows for how much paper, how many trees are lost, and any place that's recycling paper has like a thermometer that shows how many trees worth are recycled so you don't have to kill more trees. In everyday life, the consciousness of every little action 
is visible to you, it helps you instead of, instead of being vague to say, well, maybe I, I, won't, I'll, I won't use that paper, mm -hmm. something like that. Ian, last word. <laughs> yeah, I think there's a battle of ideas. Uh, and I think if you don't engage in it, you give up uh, to the extremes and others that you don't agree with. So engagement is the first level of consciousness. Take inspiration from things like the woman who did a tweet, hashtag me too, and created a global movement that brought down powerful people like Harvey Weinstein and many changed the ethics around that. Take inspiration from Greta Thunberg, school kid, 16 year old, that created a global protest movement. Take inspiration from all of these cases of extraordinary individuals, communities, movements around the issues we care about that are changing the way that people think around the world globally. Uh, if one doesn't engage in that, I believe one gives in uh, to the other forces. What the Renaissance tells us is that two people can play the information game. Savonarola deposed the Medicis. He invented the political pamphlet. We see it in the other ways now in the politics of today. So my hope is that we change consciousness by more and more people engaging with each other and with the issues based on science, on facts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, exactly. So this is very much the spirit of the discussion we've been having this week, is how do we create these ideas, how we, all of us, people watching, and uh, they have ideas that are participating in the process of development in each place, in each neighborhood, can be those people that Ian uh, is telling us about uh, in our time uh, and create in many ways the, the transformations that we hope can happen in our generation to create sustainable development to eliminate slums. So I just want to ask you to keep in touch with the foundation that many other extraordinary ideas will be forged, created, connected here in Madrid. Uh, and uh, let's thank both panels again for an extraordinary set of ideas. Thank you.